Welcome to our ongoing series of videos having to do with materials. This is from chapter four, section two on wood properties. So we've talked about general properties of materials in terms of yield stress and material stiffness. And we did that for a wide range of materials. And now we're going to focus on certain key materials that are common commonly used as uh, structural materials in buildings. So in this video, we're going to talk about wood properties. Okay, first of all, material, uh, wood comes in a variety of species, and these species have typically uh, different densities and different hardnesses and different yield stresses. So here we have um, a list of species and densities in pounds per cubic foot. Um, ash, white ash, is a very hard, uh, strong uh, hardwood. Um, it's typically used in baseball bats, um, so it's able to handle a lot of percussion and a lot of stress. It's quite dense, 43 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, we could just go down here and pick a couple of others that are pretty exceptional, like hickory is a very hard, strong wood. In this case, its density is uh, 51 pounds per cubic foot. Remember that water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, so a piece of hickory floats pretty low in the water. Um, there does exist one or two species of wood that are actually denser than water, but they are extraordinarily rare. So hickory would be one of the densest materials that we would ever have in the way of wood. Among the structural materials, though, uh, none of them are typically over 40 pounds a cubic foot. And typically, they're more in the in the range of uh, 30 to 35. So, for example, a very common uh, species would be fir, Douglas fir. Um, and by the way, there are three different kinds of fir listed here, and uh, it has something to do with where they grow, but also what the grading agencies are. Um, but they range from 31 to 34 pounds per cubic foot. Um, in addition to that, we have things like uh, hemlock. Eastern hemlock is a common building material. Also, when we come down here, we have uh, various kinds of pine. Um, so you'll notice there's southern longleaf pine, which is one of the densest of any structural materials, but the more common pine that we use is 36 pounds per cubic foot. So that's about the most dense material that we use. And we do a lot of eastern white pine and uh, hemlock. So many of the materials that we build out of are around 30 pounds a cubic foot, which is about half the density of water. So if we put them in water, um, about half of the wood would be floating above the surface and about half of it below the surface. All right, so here is an example of what we call a solid sawn piece of lumber. This is a two by four. Uh, the idea is that it's a nominal two by four. And what we mean by that is we used to saw these to two by four in the mill, and then they would shrink some before they were incorporated into a house. Then we discovered that it was a good idea to plane them and round the corners. So we have something called S4S, which means surfaced four sides, of which this is an example. When we plane it, we lose even more material from the wood. Over a period of time, the industry settled on the notion that the actual cross section of this is uh, one and a half inches in that direction and three and a half inches in that direction. So a so-called two by four is a nominal two by four and its actual dimensions are one and a half by three and a half. 
Okay, so here are some examples of um, cross sections. Here's a two by four, which is one and a half by three and a half, a two by six, which is one and a half by five and a half. When we get above a two by six, the shrinkage that occurs in the curing process is so great that we no longer have even within a half an inch. So instead of eight inches, this is seven and a quarter. And then for a two by 10, instead of one and a half by nine and a half, it's one and a half by nine and a quarter and so forth. So a two by 12 is one and a half by 11 and a quarter. And we have a two by 14 listed here, although it's been many years since anyone could commonly get a two by 14. Um, the boards tend to be to warp really badly, but also we don't grow trees big enough anymore to cut two by 14s out of. Two by 12s, in fact, are becoming fairly uncommon. Uh, and as we progress through this discussion, you'll understand why, because we have engineered lumbers uh, forms of lumber that are more efficient and uh, can go deeper and work better from a structural point of view. And by the way, I'm showing on this page a bunch of other structural properties. These are the cross-sectional dimensions. Uh, we also have the area. We have something called the section modulus, which has to do with the bending strength, and then something called the moment of inertia which I will tend to call the cross-sectional stiffness, and that has to do with how well is it going to perform in terms of feeling stiff and rugged. Okay, so here are some of the common grades of material. Uh, many years ago, we used to have many more grades of wood um, because we had lots of lumber still to be cut from, from original forest. We could get uh, dense select straight grained, free of knots. Uh, we could start with that and work down through a whole series of grades until we got down to a number one and then we had number two and finally the lowest grade material that we sell now are studs. If you go to Lowe's it's pretty rare you can even get a number one. Typically almost everything you're going to buy is a number two. So here are a bunch of um, allowed stresses if you're designing for flexure, which is bending. So this is here. For a single member usage, you can design to uh, a stress in bending of 1,652 pounds per square foot. You can design higher if you have uh, multiple members collected together sharing a load. And the reason for that is Wood is extremely variable in its qualities, and if you have just one beam to depend upon, statistically speaking, it's not as reliable, and as a consequence, uh, we downgrade the allowed stress in it. Whereas if we have two or three of them together sharing a load, then we know that in all likelihood, not all of them are going to be the poorest quality beam that you could get. So we also have here um, tension stress, um, here we have compression parallel to the grain. You notice that for this number two, the stress uh, in compression is much higher than the allowed stress and tension. And that's because uh, a member like this will have a fair number of knots. And the knots are, are useless relative to tension, but they actually still work pretty well relative to compression. And then we have some material stiffnesses and we talked in previous videos about what stiffness means. So on this sheet we have some of the common species. This is Douglas fir larch um, and that means Douglas fir and larch are lumped together uh, in the same group. Here we have uh, hemlock and fir which sounds kind of confusing because here we have some fir and there we have some fir and a lot of this has to do with uh, particular groupings of species in a given part of the country and we have grading agencies for those groupings and here we have some uh, spruce and pine and fir from the southern United States it's all lumped together typically when you go to Lowe's you can either buy number two or you can buy studs and these products have become so commodified that most people don't even look at these allowed stresses uh, 
they just go and they buy some number twos and they know how deep the beam is supposed to be for a floor in a residence, for example, that's spanning 12 feet. Um, and they just assume that whatever they buy at Lowe's is a number two. Um, so the design of wood structures is much less sophisticated today because we have far fewer options in terms of species and grades. Down below here, we've got a bunch of southern pine. That's down here. Um, and uh, the grading of that is much more complicated. Now, I don't expect you to remember a lot of this right now, but uh, eventually we may design some wood structures and then we'll have to come back to this material. Now, the way we've organized the material is uh, material properties are listed in chapter four. Then in chapter five, we deal with columns and then we need to come back to the material properties. Um, and then in the chapter six, we design beams and we have to come back to chapter four again to get material properties. But these properties are used both in the design of columns and the design of beams. So we lump it all together in one chapter on material properties. Okay, so again, this is a two by four. And as I said before, this is one and a half by three and a half. Um, two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, and two by twelves are limited in length uh, based on the trees that happen to be available. And we also have trees that have some disturbing knots in them. And so sometimes uh, we have limitations that are set by knots. Sometimes we have lots of knots and we'd like to get rid of those knots. And we have a technique for doing that. This is a two by four that's actually consists of two pieces of wood that have been finger jointed together. So I'm going to see if I can show you how this works with this pointer, if I can locate the pointer. So here we have a finger joint that's tapered, and then it's tapered back this way, and then it's tapered that way. And the idea is that any, anywhere that you imagine cutting through this or tearing through this beam, there is material there, uh, right here and right here and everywhere across this cross section that has to be failed. This works a lot better than a joint like this. So if we had two pieces of wood joined together, like so, we could imagine tearing along here where we have in grain to end grain gluing, which never works very well. And again, we have that here and we have it there. So the only really good continuous material we have is across there and across there. So we're only developing part of the cross section. This finger joint actually develops almost the entire cross sectional strength of the member. And we actually have factories that are set up to cut out uh, bad knots and re-splice the material. So in fact, this board with the splicing system is actually more reliable and stronger than the original piece was with the knot in it. Another method of joining wood together uh, is the following. So here we have two pieces of two by four that have been connected at this point. Uh, this is called a pressure plate. It used to be called a gang nail. Uh, that was the original patent name and trade name. But now the patent has run out and you'll notice that all of these spikes are literally created out of a single plate of material that had a, a, a device come down like a can opener and uh, cut and bend outward pieces of the plate. So it's like one plate with a huge number of nails on it. And the way this works is these two boards, this one and this one are set. And then this pressure plate is put in place and a hydraulic drive comes down and presses it into the wood. And there's another one of these plates on the other side of this board. We don't usually use this technique for joining two boards end to end like this. We'd finger joint that instead. But sometimes, well, we often use these, these pressure plates to make wood trusses for attics or floors of residences. And the people who use it to make the joints where there are several members coming in together uh, they also typically will splice 
pieces together using these pressure plates in this way. In other words, they don't want to bother doing both finger joining and pressure plates, so they make the connection like this. Okay, here's a piece of solid sawn material. I think this is a two by six. So um, this dimension is one and a half, and this dimension is five and a half. This particular one is treated with a copper uh, chemical that helps reduce uh, rot. So this is called treated lumber. Uh, it's able to tolerate much more moisture. Uh, the downside is the process of injecting this chemical actually does some damage to the bond between the fibers and the allowed stress in this material is 10 to 20 percent less than it would be in a non-treated piece of timber. Uh, we used to use um, four by eights cut into tongue and groove to make decking for fairly long spans and heavy loads. We don't do that anymore, but we do have this material. This is called laminated decking. There's a three quarter inch thick ply there, another three quarter inch thick ply, and then another one. And they are glued together along these surfaces. And they're offset relative to each other to produce this tongue and groove effect. So this tongue uh, will go into the next uh, timber in this location right here. So that helps uh, seal the building, but it also keeps all the wood from, from warping quite so much. This is called laminated decking. And by the way, we can buy it with many layers. So we could get it with another layer up here that would go down like that and across like that and um, pretty much whatever percentage you increase the thickness by, you can increase the span. So just for reference in North Carolina and most parts of the country, um, if we have three layers of this, they're just slightly over two inches thick and this material will span about 12 feet pretty comfortably in roofing applications. You'll notice we have really quite nice wood, and the beauty to this is um, if this is the surface that people look at, um, it's actually chosen to have the least number of knots and to be the most aesthetic. Uh, this core material can be much cheaper, and typically the, this, this surface is the surface that's going to go up, and it can also be a little rough and have some knots in it. Okay, this is called a glue lamb beam, and here we have two four boards that started off as two by fours. In this case, this dimension is one and a half. The two by fours have been glued together with a glue called resorcinol. Uh, it's a dark brown glue that's two components like epoxy and um, except it's really, really well suited for gluing wood together. So we have boats that have been made uh, by gluing wood together with resource and all glue. And many of those boats have been in the water for 50 or 60 years. And typically when they finally come apart, it's not at the glue joints, but it's due to some sort of failure of the wood. But if the, if the, if the wooden boat is pretty well cared for, uh, this resource and all glue will last the life of the boat. So it's really excellent for all kinds of applications, including places where there's water. Now in this case, this particular beam has been trimmed down to a dimension of three feet, three inches in that direction, and that's to clean up the faces of it and make it look better. So at this point, uh, this face right here is a very beautiful, um, presentable face and we might try to do these core pieces and if they have knots we try to bury the knots down in the center but especially on the bottom of the beam where everything is visible and on this surface we try to keep the best possible visual appearance um, this wood is not only very good structurally um, but it's also considered aesthetic and finished in itself so all it needs is uh, to be varnished
Now, in this case, I've put a scale on it, and you'll notice from the scale that it's still an inch and a half from right there to right there. In other words, the top and bottom of this was never planed, but then in order to make this surface look clean, we may have had to take off even more of the material in order to get a nice clean joint between the two. This is, um, so this was a bunch of two by fours and it started off uh, three and a half inches across, but by the time it's playing down, it's only three inches across. But the original two by fours are still there uh, to the full inch and a half depth. This is some two by sixes. And in this particular system, um, the boards have been planed down and now this is one and three eighths. And then when these surfaces get planed to be cleaned up, then this dimension instead of five and a half is more like five and a quarter. So this is, there's an Eastern system and a Western system. And in one of those, the surfaces of the two by six are planed down. So the two by six is only a, an inch and three eighths thick when it's glued up, but then it doesn't require as much planing on these outside surfaces. In the other system, the, the two by sixes or two by fours or whatever are kept at a full inch and a half thick, but then more has to be planed off of these surfaces in order to get them finished down. So this is an example of one of the systems. The previous one is an example of the other. So in this case, this dimension is one and three eighths. Uh, this gives you a, a sense of what the resource and all looks like. Resource and all glue is really messy and unpleasant to work with, and we try not to use it on construction sites. We do all of this uh, glue lamb work in a factory, and one of the reasons is not just that they know how to handle the wood and the glue, but they have a gigantic planer that allows these surfaces to be cleaned up after everything is glued together. So these things look really ugly, and then you run them through the planer, and everything is lined up and all the resource and all glue that's slopped all over it has been cleaned up also. So this is just putting a scale on it to demonstrate the fact that here we have the eight mark on the, on the uh, right there we have the eight inch mark and here we have the one and three eighths. So that shows that these were planed before they were glued. So here's an example that all of you are familiar with, with glue lamb beams. And I'm gonna go through a series of this. This is a little unusual because usually when we do glue lamb, uh, we use wood decking. Um, but in this case, they chose not to. This is another view of parts of RDU. Uh, here's a classic treatment of glue lamb uh, with inch and a half thick material we can give this a curvature of our radius equal to 12. So here all these members were bent around a form and then clamped and glued together. And then once they're glued, they don't snap back, they hold their shape. So literally these pieces run continuously all the way around here and down to the bottom. This is what we call a glue lamb wood rigid frame and it's very commonly used in churches i'm not quite sure what this is but it doesn't look like a church here's some glue lamb used in trusses the challenge is with these joints these joints are very tricky and here we're showing a bunch of bolts but it's it's really much more complicated than that there's a, there's a lot of metal in this connection also and if any of you are interested in designing something like this, we can talk about how those joints might get made. All right, here's some glue lamb arches with fabric stretched over them. Another example of glue lamb. This would be really beautiful, except this is one of the challenges. This material tends to be straight. And so it looks a little odd when we cut a curve like that. But the material is really beautiful. It has that warm quality of wood, and everything here is wood. This is laminated wood decking. These are glue lamb beams. 
and it's all finished so there's no sheetrock or anything that has to be applied. Here's some more images uh, and this by the way is one example of how we can do this is called a, a saddle or a, a hanger and in the case of glue lamb these are typically welded up out of thick plate um, but they can be done in a number of ways but that's a steel hanger at that location. Here's another arched system this is the Richmond Olympic Oval. It's really quite beautiful and here you'll notice that they're using wood in conjunction with this steel box truss. So actually the, the steel box truss is sort of the primary structure. In fact we have solid web steel on that side. We have it on the other side of this void then the void is triangulated with these members and then this face here is it could almost be just decorative but in fact it also does assist with the structural action. Alright so one of the things you know if you've ever worked with wood is that it splits really easily. In fact it often splits just during the curing process, the process of drying out. And so and the fibers only go in one direction so it has one really strong direction and the other direction is really weak. So somebody invented the idea of a piece of plywood. So in this plywood uh, there's grain in this face going that way then there's a layer with the grain going that way and a layer with the grain going this way and then grain going that way and then grain going that way. So in other words the layers are just alternating and they're at 90 degrees to each other. These layers are called veneer um, and that's not just when they're on the surface. Basically the idea is that they are created by putting a huge log on a lathe and then there's a, a, a huge blade that comes and as the log turns the blade goes gradually inward and layers of veneer are peeled off the tree. So it's a very efficient uh, use of the material because there's no saw kerf. So those kind of curved layers of veneer get laid flat and glued together to produce a piece of plywood. So if this was a piece of uh, solid sawn wood of this same thickness which is about three quarters of an inch um, and you took a hatchet or a knife to it you could split it really easily if you try to do that with this piece of plywood uh, you, you'd uh, find that difficult to do. And this plywood does span in both directions. So plywood is a pretty amazing material for when it was first created a lot of people thought of it as really cheap but it's able to do some pretty amazing things that are difficult to do with regular solid sawn wood. You'll notice over here, by the way, if I can point at this, the actual thickness of this is not three quarters, it's 23 30 seconds. So three quarters would be 24 30 seconds. And uh, this is one of the annoying things you're going to come across in the building industry is that for a long time uh, they specified the thickness of this as um, 24 30 seconds plus or minus a 30 second and that's because they couldn't get the thickness that accurate. But then once they'd accepted that that was a standard and they got better at controlling the dimension, they got to the point where they could make it almost exactly 23, 30 seconds, and so they consistently do that. So now they sell you something that's 23, 30 seconds, even though it started off with the idea that it was going to be three quarters of an inch. We have similar issues of that kind in the steel industry which I find deeply frustrating that as the steel industry uh, gets better at controlling tolerances they don't give you a more accurate piece of material that's the size it, that it should have been or was intended to be they give you something less than that. Okay, um, plywood has layers of veneer that are perpendicularly to, to each other to make them resistive to stress. So if I go back and look at this and I say okay I've got grain that's going in this direction so if I turned this thing up and made a beam out of it and the beam was 
this deep and that wide and was spanning in this direction. Um, you'd think that could be a pretty good beam. The problem is that the uh, certainly that beam would be resistive to shear, which is one of the failure modes in wood. The problem is that about half of your grain is going in the wrong direction. So it doesn't work very well as a beam because the material relative to stress perpendicular to the grain tends to be fairly spongy. So somewhere along the way, somebody came up with the idea that rather than we glue these uh, layers of veneer with their grain going perpendicular to each other, we glue them with their grain going generally parallel to each other. Um, and initially, of course, people said, well, you're not really going to make it stronger relative to splitting because all your grain is going in the same direction. But in fact, when we look at the layers of material, some of the layers have the grain going that way and then adjacent to them they have grain going that way. So there's slight crossing of the grain, but in general all the grain is going in the direction that you'd want for bending. So this is a piece of something we call laminated veneer lumber. This is the cross section of the beam right here, and the beam would be spanning in that direction. And then I've taken the same piece and I've turned it up so that you can you can look at this face in the light and you'll see that in fact we have no grain running parallel to that cut like we would in the case of a piece of plywood. All that grain is running perpendicular to the cut face. In other words, all the grain of this uh, thing is running in that direction. So it works really well as a beam and it's super resistive to shear failure unlike solid sawn lumber which tends to split rather easily. Um, this wood is also dimensionally very stable. This sample was sent to me by the industry and it's really bad advertising because you'll notice uh, this thing is pretty badly curved like this. Um, but that's not typical of this product and uh, I'm not quite sure where they even found this piece of junk that they sent, but I can tell you that generally speaking it's better than this. You do have to be a little bit careful though. This wood is so dimensionally stable and pretty rugged that I noticed one day at Capital City Lumber that the only material that they keep out in the yard without covering it to protect it from the rain is this LVL. And the LVL had obviously been sitting there for quite a while because uh, it was pretty badly weathered. So go pick out your own material or make sure that they're at least sending you decent stuff. Okay, so there are a number of different companies that make uh, this product of laminated veneer lumber, which we call LVL. So somewhere here I'm going to surround that name, keep it in mind. LVL, by the way, is very rugged and is comparable to glue lamb in terms of its resistance to all kinds of stresses. Uh, in general, though, glue lamb is considered a visual material, which just needs to be varnished, but most people consider LVL to be a very utilitarian kind of wood that you want to bury uh, behind sheetrock or something like that. Uh, this particular product here has the trade name Versalam and it's listed in the book with some design tables for beams made out of it. And when we get to beams, we'll talk about that. But for the time being, we're just going to note the fact that there are a number of different players in the industry that produce this product. Okay, so we can use this laminated veneer lumber in smaller sections, which we sometimes call micro lamb products or micro laminated products. In this case, uh, again, we have all the grain going this way. This is all end grain on that face. Uh, this is a fairly small dimension material. I think this dimension is about an inch and a half by maybe two inches or two and a half inches. Um, and this material is often used for the tops of trusses or also something we call eye joist, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, here's a material called bandboard. It's used 
to enclose the ends of floor joist and wood construction. Um, this particular band board is made out of oriented strand board, which we used to call wafer board, but now it's called oriented strand board. In oriented strand board, we run a bunch of scrap material through uh, a machine that chops it up into fairly thin pieces of scrap material and you'll notice the grain in all this material is going in multiple directions. It's called oriented strand board but it really means non-oriented or randomized in the sense that throughout this thing you have grain going in all kinds of directions. So we take basically a truckload of this material, we uh, cover it with glue, we put it into a bed and we compress it under heat and pressure and it all becomes glued together. And you'll notice along this edge here, or this, yeah, this edge, the sort of uh, random pattern of these layers of material. And you can get this just mashed and glued, or you can get it with a sanded off face if you have some application where that's appropriate. In the case of this band board, that's not too crucial. Okay, so oriented strand board can be used in something, or it does not split very easily. It's not as resistive to splitting as plywood is, but it's pretty darn good. So we can take it and we can do something we could never do with solid sawn lumber. In other words, if we had a piece of solid sawn lumber shaped like this, the last thing in the world we'd ever want to do is go in and remove material. Uh, first, we don't want to spend money doing that, but second of all, we'd make a horribly weak beam. But because this material right here is oriented strand board, it's resistive to splitting, it's resistive to buckling. And so we come along and we taper it on the edges right here, and we jam it up into a tapered slot with glue on each side. This is a material that's basically like one and a half by two inches in actual dimension. Um, we can get long lengths of it by finger joining it together. So you can buy this thing, which is called an eye joist. So it's called an eye joist for obvious reasons. It has an eye section uh, shape. Um, we can get them up to 16 inches deep and we can buy them 60 or 80 feet long so they can be shipped to the site and then cut to length uh, for a variety of applications. Um, this is a glue-like resource and all. It's uh, extremely durable, so when you buy a house made out of this, you can assume it's not going to just fall apart in 30 years because the glue falls apart. Um, this taper helps get a more friction connection between the web and the flange material. Um, and that also helps with the durability of it. But the taper is particularly crucial because they don't actually have to clamp it. Once they squeezed everything together, the glue uh, cures because the web is held in this tapered uh, slot by the friction between the two materials. So again, this is finger jointed flange material, top and bottom, and oriented strand board web. We can also take our micro lamb material that we talked about earlier, which is basically laminated veneer lumber, and we can make a top cord out of that. So that's what's happening in this case. Uh, this is laminated veneer lumber or micro lamb material. And then in this case, they've used plywood. So they have grain going this way, grain going that way, and on the layer in between, the grain is running along the length of it. So this web member, I personally like this particular configuration the best of all. I have a bit more confidence in the plywood than the oriented strand board, and a bit more confidence in the laminated uh, veneer lumber and the top and bottom cords or flanges than I would finger jointed flanges. But all of these have similar ratings and the industry has basically said they're all very acceptable for use in residential construction.
Okay, so uh, this is the Boise Cascade data. It shows some information on the depth and shapes of these things. And again, as I said, um, you can get up to about 16 inches deep with these. You could go deeper. There's no technical reason. You could go 24 feet, but typically uh, 16 inches, I mean, 24 inches deep, but typically 20, 16 is the deepest standard section. But with that, you can span a roof that's 36 feet or so under the kinds of snow loads that we have in Raleigh. So you could design a house with a flat roof and have a 36 foot span across that house using this really, really simple construction technique. This is called Paralam. It's basically a, a system where we take a bunch of scrap lumber again. We split it up into long strips um, and then we put glue and glue them together under heat and pressure. So this is called Paralam to sort of express the parallel nature of all these strips of wood. I have seen this, by the way, used in furniture. It's pretty inexpensive material. And if you plane it and varnish it, it's actually quite beautiful. It has a sort of bizarre quality to it. It looks like some strange kind of plant, but it's actually just ordinary wood that's been stripped into little pieces and glued back together. This is the ultimate in, in sort of degraded engineering lumber. This is basically sawdust mixed with with plastic and this is a one inch depth and this material is used for outdoor decking and it's really kind of nice because there are no splinters uh, there are no knots and it's pretty durable and pretty weatherable in the rain um, it consumes a lot of plastic though um, but it's a way of getting rid of sawdust that uh, we otherwise wouldn't be using. And ironically, that sawdust, even as pathetic as it is, these little teeny flecks of wood, actually not only save us plastic, but they're a bit stiffer than the plastic. So they help stiffen this final product uh, slightly. Okay, so here's a building that's an example of almost all this stuff. So up above, we have some solid sawn uh, collar beams. Here you'll notice some eye joists on each side. These eye joists are absolutely wonderful because we can get them in lengths that we could never get solid sawn lumber. So it allows us to do a building pretty economically that has these really long rafters in it. And actually that rafter right there and that one right there are laminated veneer lumber. So over here we have pretty light loads and we use eye joist, but where we have this dormer coming over and more collar beams there, the dormer is delivering a lot of loads through this wall right here, and those loads are getting taken up by this uh, laminated veneer lumber. So we're just thickening it up and making it more sturdy by using an LVL instead of this super lightweight eye joist. So over here, we have a bunch of uh, two by four studs, or these may be two by sixes, I can't remember. <clears throat> this building, by the way, has got a lot of stuff in it. It has a steel um, uh, raft, not rafter beam, but uh, ridge beam. That ridge beam is delivering its load through this steel column which is coming down here and loading a whole bunch of 2x4 or 2x6 studs that have been contained together. Then that huge load from the roof is getting delivered to this, which is a very deep and very thick laminated veneer lumber. So we have this interesting thing here where we have doubled up 2 by something or others of solid sawn lumber uh, to do this little span over the door and they even work right here over this wide door But they can't manage this giant load that's coming down to the roof So in this case we use laminated veneer lumber And then you'll notice here these columns are like just a huge number of studs nailed together 
Uh, that way everything's contained within the wall, but by continuing to uh, nail a bunch of them together, we're able to carry a very substantial amount of load. This is looking up at the ridge beam up above, which is a wide flange steel section. That could have been made out of a glue lamb, it could have been made out of an LVL, um, but whoever did this decided that it was cheaper and easier maybe to use a, uh, uh, a wide flange steel section. Uh, this column is a steel tube. This could have been, by the way, a whole slew of uh, studs laminated together, but they chose to make it out of steel. So this is a slightly closer view showing how that column comes to bear on five um, scabbed together uh, studs which come down right in the middle. So this is an interesting kind of design challenge because you really want uh, this fireplace central, but you're also bringing down these huge forces centrally. And so it's kind of, this is an example, by the way, of what we call a transfer beam and that there are major loads coming from a column up above and it's having to transfer those loads out to the side. We try not to do that, but in the case of this building, uh, there was no way they wanted to design it where the fireplace was not central. So this is basically the fireplace. Here's just another view, again showing uh, laminated veneer lumber there and eye joists here. And this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these little members like these collar beams and those rafters and all these collar beams, those are all solid sawn lumber. So whoever designed, the, designed this just plucked out all of these things to incorporate wherever they were useful. This is a doubled up two by 10 over a doorway. This is called a header beam. And you'll notice this header beam in wood construction always comes to bear on a couple of studs that are there specifically for, to support that header beam. So this is a beam that was more heavily loaded and in this case again it's laminated veneer lumber. So you can see the veneer layers all in this material. So that ends our discussion of wood properties from chapter four, section two.